living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now a moment ago, he said eternal life, live forever. But now he's talking about having life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one that feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert and they died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Notice the tremendous promise here. This is a promise of eternal life. He's talking firstly about himself and those that would accept him and receive him. But later on, he'll bear this out over a Passover dinner that he will serve. And being and serving in the role of the father of the household, he will serve to the disciples this dinner which we today call communion. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. I, I've been recently very interested in these near-death experiences. There are so many people that claim to have died and come back. And their experiences are very real to them, extremely real. In fact, they say it's more real than their life when they come back. Many of them say they ask to remain there, they beg to stay. But here's the thing that concerns me. Some see the Hindu gods. Some see Allah. Not all see Jesus. You say, well, certainly not all see Jesus. Not all are saved. No, no. I'm talking about all unsaved people. Some claim to see the Lord and some claim to see all kinds of strange things on the other side. And so if you're going to use that as a basis for your faith, you're going to be in trouble. Because now you're accepting somebody's subjective experience. I don't believe that we should place any weight on any material that somebody says they saw on the other side. In fact, place your weight in the Bible, in the words of God. In the words of Jesus, it's a walk by faith and faith alone. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. There is the promise. We don't need to go near death or around death or be dead for a day or a week or a year and come back with some wonderful story of what we've seen on the other side. I read one man once, and he claimed that he and Jesus were having a good time on the other side. They were skipping stones on the water. And then he was sort of telling jokes with the Lord. The Lord was telling jokes to him, and uh, he saw buildings of, of limbs, uh, the, uh, miracles that were unclean. And then they saw secretaries running around that were tending uh, 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 large 
uh, 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 card files. Well, you'd have to tell me that heaven is run by secretaries with card files? No. I don't accept that. I don't accept it at all. The answer is in Jesus Christ, we find life. Amen. Amen. Eternal life is found in him. It's not found in somebody's near death experience. It's not found in somebody's meditation. It's not found in somebody's wonderful intellectual information. It's found in Christ. And as part of that, he's given us this communion. But it has tremendous roots. And I hope you can follow me with this. Take your Bibles and turn back to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Second Chronicles chapter 30. It says, Hezekiah sent word to all Israel. Now, Hezekiah, his name means Jehovah has made strong or God has made me strong. He's known as good King Hezekiah. Bad King Ahab, good King Hezekiah. Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, inviting them to come into the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate Passover the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. The king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month. Now the Passover was to be celebrated in the first month. But they decided this particular year, for reasons beyond their control, to celebrate this in the second month. They would not been able to celebrate it at the regular time because it was, there was not enough priests that had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. So the priesthood in that particular year was not consecrated. They weren't ready. And so because of that, the people hadn't gathered. And normally, every male over 13 years of age had to gather three times a year. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Well, that year, something went wrong. And a plan seemed right to both the king and the whole assembly. And they decided to send a proclamation throughout Israel. From Beersheba to Dan. By the way, that's an interesting reading. Normally, it's from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. This time, because Jerusalem is located pretty much in the south, it's from Beersheba up to Dan. Calling the people to come to Jerusalem and celebrate Passover to the Lord the God of Israel. It had not been celebrated in large numbers according to what was written. Now just stop for one second. Notice what's happening in our world. Church services are interrupted. Large numbers are no longer permitted to gather. There's a parallel between what's happening in the world now and what was happening then. And even though they were instructed to do it in the first month of their year, because they had a heart to do it and wanted to do it, they did it in the second month. And you're going to see that God honored it. And the king's command, at the king's command, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king and from his officials, which read, People of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he may return to you who are left, who have escaped from the hand of, the, of Assyria. Do not be like your fathers and, or, or, and brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their fathers, so that he made them an object of horror as you see. Do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were. Submit to the Lord. Come to the sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. If you return to the Lord, 
that your brothers and children will be shown compassion by their captors and will come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. People need to start coming back to the house of the Lord. Amen. And I'm looking forward to the days when we can open this building up and begin to house people once again inside the house of the Lord. The couriers went from town to town in Ephraim and Manasseh, as far as Ebulun, but the people scorned and ridiculed them. Nevertheless, some of the men from Asher, Asher and, and Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind, to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered, following the word of the Lord. A very large crowd assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month. They removed from the altars in Jerusalem, uh, pardon me, they removed the altars in Jerusalem and cleared away the incense altars and threw them into the Kidron Valley. Now let me just tell you what's happening. Hezekiah was a young king and when he came to power, he cleaned out Israel of all its idol worship. And that's what's being described here. And they threw all that stuff into the Kidron Valley. Which is the valley right beside Jerusalem. They slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the second month. And the priests and the Levites were ashamed and consecrated themselves. And bought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. And they took up their regular positions as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood and handed to them, uh, handed to them by the Levites. Since many in the crowd were not had not consecrated themselves, the Levites had to kill the Passover lambs for all those who were ceremonially not clean and could not consecrate their own lambs or their lambs to the Lord. You know, one of the arguments against having communion is that people say, well, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not necessarily right with God this week. Well, first of all, you're either right with God or you're not right with God. And if you're not right with God, you're not saved. If you're saved, you're right with God. You may be backslidden. You may have issues in your life. But I'll tell you what. God said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never turn my back on you. Amen. Since many in the crowd have not consecrated themselves. Many say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not clean enough this week. I, 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 I haven't uh, done certain things that I should have done this week. Well, listen, let me tell you something. God has made provision in the blood of Jesus. He's made provision for you. The Levites had to kill the Passover lambs for all those that were not ceremonially clean and could not consecrate their lambs to the Lord. Although most of the people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. Now you would think God would visit judgment on them. Here are all these people that had not prepared themselves for the Passover because it had been suddenly announced we're going to do it in the second month and they were not ready for that. Well... It says, but Hezekiah prayed saying, may the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets his heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even if he is not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. Here is the king, pardon me, here's the, 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 yes, the king who is beginning to pray for the people. And he's basically saying, Lord, there, there are some that are not, not exactly right. There are some that haven't consecrated themselves there are some that really just don't have it all together right now but but God they have a heart to serve you God they love you Lord God recognize what they're trying to do here and bless them in spite of their faults in spite of their failings in spite of their weaknesses you know you need to understand God is not looking to squash you like a bug it is his plan to bless you in spite of yourself in spite of your weaknesses, in spite of your failures. It says in verse 20, and if you're an underliner and you're reading from a 
tangible Bible or you're using your device, I want you to underline the next verse entirely. Verse 20. Remember what just happened. Hezekiah said, Lord, there are some that aren't right. There are some that aren't consecrated. In fact, there's large numbers of them. But they've come down here to worship you. They've come down here because they have a heart to do this. Now, Father, bless them and forgive them. And look at verse 20. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. <laughs> healed the people. It meant that those that went down to Jerusalem got miraculous healings over the Passover. Those that were sick were healed. It's very reminiscent of the time when the serpent was put up and the fiery serpent were fiery serpents were biting the people and they were dying and the cure was those that should look to the serpent on the pole would live. And right here we have something very akin to this. Those that put themselves out. Those that put aside their schedule. Those that didn't put themselves and their family and their activities first, but put God first. And met together, God healed them. How remarkable is that? Imagine going down there with a sore hip and coming away with a new hip. Going down there with a broken leg and coming away with a brand new leg. Going away down there with a broken arm and coming back with a brand new arm. Going down there with, a, with an illness and a sickness of some kind and coming away cured because God had healed them. God heard Hezekiah's prayer and God healed them. And when did he heal them? He healed them over the Passover dinner. What is communion? It is the Passover dinner that we are celebrating. And I believe that there is healing in the Passover dinner. The Israelites who were present in Jerusalem celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days with great rejoicing, while the Levites praised and sung to the Lord every day, accompanied by the Lord's instruments of praise. Amen. I guarantee there were drummers there. And Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all the Levites who showed good understanding of the service of the Lord. For the seven days they ate their assigned portion and offered fellowship offerings and praised the Lord. The God of their fathers, the whole assembly then agreed to celebrate the festival seven more days so that another seven days they celebrated joyfully. So they go down for the seven day celebration, but they were having such a wonderful time in God. They had such a revival, such joy broke out amongst them at the healing and at the presence of God that they decided to carry the meeting on another seven days. You say, well, so what? Well, let me tell you, there were no hotels, there were no motels. People had come on donkey and horseback. People had walked for miles. And they had got to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem, and they had this tremendous meeting with God, it was so awesome that at the end of seven days, when it was supposed to end, they sat down and said, you know, the presence of God is so wonderful. Let's go another seven days. And Hezekiah the king provided a thousand bulls and seven thousand sheep and goats for the assembly. And the officials provided them with a thousand bulls and ten thousand sheep and goats. And a number of priests consecrated themselves. And the entire assembly of Judah rejoiced along with the priests and the Levites and all who had assembled in Israel. Including the aliens who had come from Israel and those who lived in Judah. There was great joy in Jerusalem for since the days of Solomon, son of King David, said David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. They were having a revival, and it started with the communion. It started with the Passover dinner. The priests and the Levites stood to bless the people 
and God heard them for their prayers reached heaven, his holy dwelling place. What an amazing scripture. What an amazing scripture. It's one thing to take the communion, shut your eyes and take it down and go off without thinking about it. But it takes on a whole brand new dimension when you begin to realize this was God's plan for you. There's healing in this. There's blessing in this. There's encouragement in this. There's strength in this. The Bible says this. It's found in Leviticus chapter 17. For the life of the creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. The life of the creature is in the blood. The life of the creature is in the blood. When you take that drink into your hands, you're drinking the life of Jesus. The life of God. Now we know it's spiritual. We know it's symbolic. We know it's not literal blood. Nor have we ever taught that. We do not believe in transubstantiation. You are taking an emblem, a representative. When Jesus handed out the communion to his disciples, and he said, this is my flesh which is given for you, and this is my blood which is poured out for you. He was in his flesh, and his blood was still in his veins. So they took an understanding. This had spiritual meaning. Today, we forget that it had any kind of meaning. In many cases, it just becomes a little snack at the end of the service. It's like I've been a good boy or a good girl, sat the service through. I deserve this. Where's my cookies? You need to understand, we have to discern the Lord's body. We have to discern what is happening here. In John chapter 6, verse 41, it says that, that at, this, uh, at this, the Jews began to grumble about him and said, uh, pardon me, about him because he said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can we now, how can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. Verse 47. I tell you the truth. He that believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. Your forefathers ate men on the desert and they died. But here is a bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. Amen. Let me tell you what happens when you die. There is an instantaneous switching of realms. Some of you are old enough to remember changing channels on your television. That was when the children were the remote control. Some are old enough to remember that. Dad would want another channel. And one of the children would be appointed to go up to the TV and go clunk. And invariably they'd go two clunks and miss what he was trying to find. But that clunk was instantaneous. And in that millisecond, it went from the channel they were watching to the new channel. At death, this is what happens. It's a changing of channels instantaneously. Instantaneously. So much so that the Lord would turn around to a woman that he was talking to. And he would say, if you believe in me, you, even though you die, you will not die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe. Death of the body is real. Death of the believer is in some ways not real. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it is an instantaneous change 
of states so fast and so quick that there's no reason to believe anybody's even aware of it. And then the Jews began to argue, sharp, argue sharply amongst themselves, how could this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. So when we eat this meal and drink this cup, we have life. Life in this body as well. Healing in this body as well. Strength in this body as well. And I will prove that to you in a moment. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is real food and my drink blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the Father sent me I, and I live because of the Father. So the one that feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Amen. There's a twofold promise here. There's a promise of life here and now, and there's a promise of eternal life. Well, you know the passage as well as I do. It's found in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Take your Bibles and turn there with me. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three. 23. And here's what it says. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Now, understand what Paul just said. Paul just said, I didn't hear this from the disciples. This wasn't the scuttlebuck that was floating around. This is not hearsay. The Lord spoke to me personally. And here's what he told me. For what I received from the Lord, I also passed it on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as his body was pierced and nailed to that cross. So our wafers are pierced. And we eat them as a representation of the body of the Lord Jesus. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, by the way, there are five cups at a Passover dinner. Here's the cup that comes after dinner. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you take this cup, you're not remembering the old Passover of Moses. You're remembering me. What the Lord did is he took that Passover and he fulfilled it. And he demonstrated it. And then he said to them, listen, you Jewish boys, from now on, when you gather for Passover and you gather for communion, you're not any longer going to be celebrating what Moses gave, but you're going to do this remembering me and what I have done. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You do show it forth. You do demonstrate his death until he comes. Well, the death of the Lord is different to everyone else's death. It's different because he didn't stay dead. He died all right, but he came back to life three days later. And so when we proclaim his death, we're not just proclaiming the fact that he died, but that he's also alive and therefore came back, proving that he is the God he said he was. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he come. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. 
Well, what does that mean? Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, who would be unworthy to take this? Well, if you're Catholic, you're going to be told that the unworthy person would be the person who, in fact, had not confessed or been to confession. And therefore, you are not fit to take the communion. But that's not how we believe. We believe that the person that is unworthy of communion is the person that is unsaved. You don't cast your pearls before swine. You don't give to the ungodly that which is godly. You take that thing that is godly and you give it to God's people. The anointing was never for the unsaved. The prophets of old didn't walk around with the horn of oil and just anoint people willy-nilly who are unsaved, ungodly, uncircumcised Philistines. The anointing was only for those who were believers. And so is the communion. It is solely for those who are believers. Whoever eats this and drinks uh, without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment to himself. Actually, verse 28. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. And that's true. A man ought to examine himself. Am I in the faith? Do I believe? Am I a servant of the Lord? Before I reach my hand out and take this, I, I'm very cautious about giving communion to visitors to church. If they're saved, I don't care what church they belong to, that's fine. Saved is saved. But if they're not saved and they're visitors to the church, they should not be given communion. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment to himself. Recognizing the body of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, let me ask you, how is the Lord's body right now? Is the Lord sick? We know that he carried our sicknesses. Is the Lord crippled over? We know that he carried our diseases. According to Isaiah 53, and I'll deal with this in coming weeks. There's a tremendous mistranslation there. And I'll deal with those two words that are mistranslated in the coming weeks. But for the moment, if we ask ourselves, what is the Lord like right now? I see him in the book of Revelation high and lifted up. I see him anointed, strong, healthy, and powerful like no other human being. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, I recognize that he is strong, that he is powerful, that he is well, that he's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, and that, praise God, he's interceding for us even right now. Somebody say amen. 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 For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment to himself. That's why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. That term fallen asleep would be for us dying. A number of you are dead. Some of you just look dead. That's why, that's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. Why? Because People have failed to recognize the significance of what they're taking. Again, this is why we don't give it to the unsaved. It's not just a quick snack for them. This meal has spiritual significance. And he said, because of this, some have become sick and some have become weak and some have actually died. 
Now hold it. If that's true for those that do not recognize the body and the blood of the Lord, then I have to ask you, what is true for those who do recognize the body and blood of the Lord? And here's what I'm going to suggest. As there is punishment for those who take this thing in an unworthy manner, there is blessing to those who take it in a worthy manner. Amen. Remember when Hezekiah said, God, there are some that aren't consecrated, but their hearts are right. They want to serve you. Please accept them. And they served the communion. And guess what happened? God healed them. And I believe that as you take the communion, God is going to bring healing into your life. God is going to bring healing into your body. God is going to strengthen you. God is going to lift you out of the doldrums. He's going to lift you out of the darkness. Amen. He's going to make a change in your life. He's going to give you energy and strength. This is real food. This is real food. Spiritual food to touch the hearts and lives of men. Not only is there eternal life found in this, but there is healing found in the communion. Well, he goes on, talks about those that are eating and drinking and so on giving commands to how you should do it. But I just want to instruct you and tell you this. You're not here by mistake. If you're not well, you need this communion. In our modern world, we're used to faith healers laying hands on the sick. And that's good. I have no problem with that. But here is something you can do at home by yourself with your communion. You can take the wafer. You can take the juice. You can take this as communion. No, you don't need a pastor there. No, it's not sacrilegious. According to the New Testament, you are a minister. And you could administer to yourself and you can administer to your sick family members. And the sicker they are, the more they need it. And if they're sick unto death, I give it to them every single day. And you will see improvement. And eventually, the sick will get well. For God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent. This is an amazing thing, this communion. And no, I don't just mean this particular communion. I mean communion in general. It's often and most often called the Lord's Supper. Because it's patterned after the dinner, the, the final dinner that the Lord had on the earth with the disciples. Half of the book of John is dedicated to this. It's a remarkable, remarkable meal. And he's passed it down. And he said, listen, you in Calvary Grace, do this in remembrance of me. Because when you do this, you are showing forth the Lord's death until he comes. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious, precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I, I just thank you for this remarkable meal. Our people have received it in their cars right now. We're going to share this together. And, and I just pray that you would bring healing into them as maybe for the first time they step back and they recognize our Savior strong and healthy. And they apply that 
to their own lives. Lord, in Jesus' precious name, let this be a moment of change in their lives, a moment of healing. Take away fear. Take away anxiety. Lower blood pressure. Father, in the name of Jesus, bring down every condition that affects their bodies. Bring blood sugar down. Lord, in Jesus' precious name, kill and squash cancer to death. Let there be tremendous healing in the bodies of these people as we recognize what Jesus has done for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.